happy Friday, everyone. And as you can probably tell from my voice and the fact that I am filming this from my sick bed, I just wanted to hop on and thank all of you for your kind words and your thoughtfulness in inquiring about me. I will kick this. I just haven't quite gotten over the hump yet. So in the meantime, Stuart and I thank you. And Stuart is going to be putting up um, a, a workshop that I did earlier in the spring for garden media called The Great Grow Along. And it is basically just a kind of an overview of my book. And I hope you'll enjoy it. Maybe it answered some additional questions you have that weren't answered by the book. And I'm lying here and finding it ironic that while I'm filming this, even inside, you can still hear the noise of equipment outside because we had a big windstorm that came through and some people are having some work done on their trees. So um, as always, certain things go on as usual. So you guys have a great weekend. Again, thank you so much for your kindness and hopefully I will be back up and in front of the camera soon. You guys have a great weekend. Well, hello everybody, and thank goodness spring is just around the corner. My name is Linda Vodder. I'm a self-taught gardener, garden designer, garden writer, garden stylist. In essence, I just produce garden media, and I've been doing it here in my Oklahoma City home for about the past 30 years. I have an old English Tudor home that we have restored, and then I just created a garden around it, and I've incorporated a lot of edibles into my land and that's what I want to talk about today, specifically as it relates to my own potage, which is an ornamental kitchen garden. And it doesn't make any difference if you're a new gardener, an experienced gardener, if you're doing nothing but container gardening, or your garden is, is way out on your back 40 with lots of room for fruit and trees and nuts and all sorts of edibles. Whatever the scale of your gardening, today's workshop is for you. In fact, I I didn't know anything when I started. I continued to learn. I continued to make a lot of mistakes, but I did write a book about it, and that's what this workshop is loosely going to be based on. How to design an edible landscape and your own edible garden that fits the style of gardening you do, the scale of where you garden, related to what zone you garden in, and all sorts of other kinds of considerations that will make sure that your edible landscape is a good garden fit for you. So let's get started. Well, I'm so passionate about incorporating edibles into my landscape that I even wrote a book about it. It's called The Elegant and Edible Garden, and pretty much everything that I'm going to discuss today is in this book. It'll be available in April, so if you want it as a reference, then I would suggest that you put it in your cart and you refer back to it as you build your own dream garden. And this is my dream garden. This is my potage. I started this about 30 years ago, and it obviously has matured. It has morphed many times based on weather events, based on my own interests, based on my lifestyle and my family's interests. In other words, I created a good garden fit of my own elegant and edible garden at my home here in Oklahoma City. Now, if you are starting your own edible garden, again, regardless of the scale or your experience as a gardener, there are certain tips that you want to incorporate into your learning curve. If you're a beginning gardener, my best recommendation would be to start small. It's how I did it. I really believed then and I believe now that it's much better to have a successful, well-tended, um, well-groomed small garden than a large one that you just can't keep up with. That can be really demoralizing a little bit later down the line. Initially, you might want to keep it simple, whether that's in containers or a raised bed. But if you're just starting out, then I would suggest nothing larger than maybe a 10 by 10 foot garden. Also be very selective and try not to go overboard when those seed catalogs go in and you're trying to select what kinds of vegetables, flowers, herbs, fruits will fit into your landscape. Start with some 
something that's easy to grow, that's simple, and won't be beyond your experience level. Just start. Do one thing at a time, do it well, then move on to and learn about the next thing. So for me, I aspired to have a very specific kind of garden. And for me, it was more about a garden that was a gardening lifestyle rather than just a pretty place to grow flowers and vegetables. I wanted an area that I could interact with, where I could I could cook from it, I could entertain in it, and that I could really make it part of my daily rounds. I wanted it to be sensual, I wanted it to be beautiful, and I wanted it to be interactive so that both myself and and my family could harvest from it, plant in it, and really enjoy it as it developed over time. I also wanted to make sure that it very much matched the style and setting of my English tutor home. I wanted to make it my own. For you, you want to take into account the style of your own garden, its setting, how much light you have, how much sun you have, all of those different considerations that make your landscape very perfect personal and specific to you. This is my home. As you can see, it's definitely an English Tudor home. It's a historic home. And I think that influences the style that I've gardening of gardening that I do. Now it's difficult to tell from this image, but interplanted amongst all of these hundreds of tulips and linear feet of violas and pansies and phlox incorporated in there, and you'll see some close-ups of this later on, are lots of edibles. I've got cabbages in here. I've got chamomile. I have uh, lettuces. I've got different kinds of greens and herbs, all of which wind in and out and are part of the totality of the landscape that is my spring garden. So when you're deciding what you want and how you want to incorporate edibles into your landscape, it's really important to just ask yourself some questions. What exactly is it that you want? Do you want to grow a few containers on your terraced balcony? Do you want to have a a major garden that you can grow from, that you can share your bounty and your harvest with friends? In other words, what are the contours of what what it is your dream garden consists of. What are your constraints and limitations? For me, I live in an urban setting. I've got a very dedicated amount of square footage that I could really relegate to growing edibles. I thought it might be kind of fun to, to be a copycat, and I could get um, some a lot of great ideas from different gardens that were similar in style to mine. So I started just looking at different gardens that I could copycat, And then I started to deconstruct what it was about those gardens that I found so very appealing, appealing in terms of what was being grown, the color palette, what fragrances I smelled, how the light played, all of those different kinds of considerations that really made gardens that appealed to me magical. For example, this one, I could easily point out a number of different things that makes this setting absolutely phenomenal, even though there's not an edible to be seen in it. I love the pops of color. I love the fact that the garden furnishings echo and mimic the color of the hydrangeas. And these are things that in any type of garden or landscape, you too can replicate. Color echoes and a color palette that speaks to your style of gardening. Here's an example of a really fabulous garden. This is my beloved Barnsley House garden in the Cotswolds in the UK. This was started by Rosemary Very, a, really a, one of my most um, most admired gardeners. She started a garden here many, many years ago. And even though she was not formally trained, she became one of the foremost personalities in potager design and in edible 
landscaping. And this here does so much so well, even though there's a minimum of color. But from this, I might want to copy the ideas of an arbor, of the fact that there's a wonderful focal point, the fact that as you look through towards that focal point, you look through a window of espaliered apples, very, very much here that I might want to copy in my own garden. Again, whether my garden is very small or very large. Here are lots, this, this image here, it probably best exemplifies my ideas about copycat garden, gardening. I stole so many ideas from this, from the brickwork to the linearity and the, the different uh, forms of the edibles themselves, how they played against one another, the gradations of green, the fact that it was enclosed, and the beautiful way that the the stone walls, the metal gate, all of that has such an organic vibe that really would do well in my own English Tudor landscape. So when you look at gardens, deconstruct how different forms and different elements of that garden might play into your dream garden. And to do that, I found it's really helpful to record words that describe a garden's appeal. So when I go and I, I visit a different kind of garden, whether it is an edible landscape, a vegetable garden, um, a pool garden, it really doesn't matter. I keep a notebook and I write down words that describe what I find so attractive about that garden space. So in that previous image, I identified things like the fact that there was a woven element to it with lots of texture. It seemed like there were birds and insects humming. It was very alive. It was intimate because it was enclosed. There was a certain geometry to it. I envisioned that just on the outskirts of that space, I could entertain. It's also easily navigable, so you could walk through it. Lots of layering with different things planted and and designed and displayed at different heights. But most importantly, it had a real element of calm, which is so important to the gardening lifestyle that I wanted to create and that you might want to create as well. But primarily, the most beautiful garden is a healthy garden, because a healthy garden will create that kind of beauty and liveliness that you so desire. So do some research. You have access to almost unlimited amounts of information online, in books, uh, your neighbors, your other experienced gardeners in your circles could give you just all sorts of information that you can tap into. Gardeners are very, very generous. There are apps. There's just really no resource that you can't tap into that will give you information about what you can grow in your area and what is required to make those plants healthy, um, abundant, and give you a great harvest. You need to figure out what a plant and a garden needs, and sometimes that can be a balancing act. One thing that I struggle with here is that in Oklahoma, quite often we're in periods of drought, and then we'll get all of our rain all at one time. So for me, it's a balancing act of not overwatering, not underwatering, and just making sure that I'm provid providing what my plants and the garden in general needs. There is no one size that fits all. You can get recommendations about how much water that a plant needs, like these leaks here in this picture, but it all depends on where you garden and what your gardening situation is in terms of rainfall, temperature, quality of soil. So those are just recommendations. There is no one size that fits all when looking at plant guidelines. 
Here's a beautiful example of what I discussed earlier. In my front garden beds, I love to have the really fine textured lacy quality of chamomile that blends in beautifully with this, these violas, which I, since I garden organically, could also be edibles in a salad or to decorate a, a cake or something. But what I love is the play of textures, that ferny texture and that kind of really bright green against that periwinkle blue and that beautiful soft yellow. And let me tell you guys, since since it's all about a gardening lifestyle, when you walk through these beds in the spring and the warming sun hits that chamomile, the fragrance is absolutely unbelievable. There are also what I call things that are that are gardening aha moments that will really help you garden where you live. And let me give you a couple of examples. And you might want to record your own on a piece of paper as we walk through this. For many, many years, I, I grew a lot of beautiful ornamentals, evergreens, um, different salad greens and vegetables in pots and in really large pots. And they would be happy one day. And then it seemed to me that as soon as the sun reached a certain point on the horizon, they weren't happy any longer. And I did what I could. I would sometimes water them more. I'd wonder if they needed to be fed. But really, all they needed was to be moved. And that was my aha moment that containers can be moved. And you might have similar kind of thump your head. Why didn't I think of that sooner? Aha moments that will help you garden more effectively and garden better where you live. That might mean that one day you plant your lettuce in one area and then later in the season you plant it in another area. Gardening, gardening is very, it's a very dynamic thing. It's not static at all. It's ever changing. And you as a gardener need to be really observant and change along with it and grow what wants to grow, where it wants to grow and how it wants to grow. And this is an example of me helping some neighbors who are trying to design a new landscape. And we would put one plant here and another plant there until we got it to the point where we felt like it was getting just the right sun exposure and you know, just the right vibe to give them the kind of complexity that they wanted in their front yard. Now, obviously, this is a more design driven kind of program, there will be other presenters who will talk a lot more about soil and nutrients and water needs and space and airflow, how much light, but a lot of that again will depend on where you garden. So many of these garden needs, I can interpret one way here in my southern zone seven garden, but those of you that are gardening farther north, this could be completely different. You may never need to do any supplemental watering. You may not have to have an in-ground irrigation system because your rain and your precipitation is reliable. Um, you may not have to prune up your trees to get more space and get more airflow with better circulation to prevent diseases in your edible landscape because, uh, because you may not have trees in the area in which you garden. So, so much of this is contextual, but regardless of where you garden, all of these basic needs need to be heated and accounted for in your gardening environment. Now, as I said earlier, depending on where you garden, light exposure is extremely important. So here in my Zone 7 garden and in most gardens, you'll read instructions that say full sun is defined as six or more hours, part sun four to six hours, part shade, and so forth. But trust me, in a sweltering July here in Oklahoma City, when temperatures hover above the century mark, I promise you, 
you, I don't care what it is, absolutely everything will benefit from some afternoon shade. So take that into account. If you live in an area that is far more cloudy, that doesn't have as great a number of sunny days as we do here in my neck of the woods, then you want to take that into account. So what this requires is lots of observation, recording, and just paying attention to what your plants need and what they respond to. Now, obvious, obviously for me, I want whatever type of gardening that I do to match my garden style and setting. Right now, I garden in an English Tudor home, and my potager and my edible landscape really reflects that style. But you may have a completely different vibe to your garden. You might uh, live in a Federalist style house, a very contemporary house. You might live in an adobe. You might live in an apartment. You might have a brick exterior or a wood exterior. All of those things are going to inform the type of gardening that you do. You really want to make it personal because your garden will transcend horticulture, just collecting plants and implementing a certain design. It really, you really want it to communicate your sense of style of things that you like and don't like. If you really love peppers, then grow them to your heart's content and no matter how many people grow tomatoes, if you don't like tomatoes, then you don't have to grow them. And it even will, will really reflect your value set of what's important to you. So gardening organically and in a water-wise way is extremely important to me. And it really reflects my value set, which is all part of what I consider to be living a true garden lifestyle. And here is another example of how I have, have just created my own garden based on things that I like and that I don't like. And one thing that I really like is a great contrast between architectural forms. I love geometric forms like these rounded topiaries against really blousy plants like the salvia and the dragon wing begonias. I've got lots of scent to geraniums and things that I also use in this area, and I like it to have a romantic feel. All of those things very much reflect my own garden style and make it my own. And everything that we're doing is going to relate to what I call good garden fit. And you may live in an area where you, you walk in your neighborhood and you think, oh, well, this looks like it kind of belongs and is seamless in my, in my neighborhood. It enhances the beauty of the homes in my neighborhood and the landscapes rather than detracts from it. So you want to take that into account what your neighborhood is like, um, how large or small your family is. So my definition for me of good garden fit has drastically changed over time. When my boys were small, I grew things that they liked to eat and that were easy for me to plant. Now that it's just my husband and myself, I don't plant as many edibles. I concentrate a lot more on herbs, but the size of my family in informed what kinds of things that I grew. Obviously, I've talked about it to, it to a great extent, and that is that the geography of where you live will greatly influence what you grow. So I really can beautifully grow peppers and beans and basil and certain heat-loving vegetables. Not so much things like artichokes that um, I... It, typically gets a little bit too cold here. Lots of herbs like cilantro, it gets very hot very quickly here and they tend to like cooler temperatures. So I take into account what the plants need in terms of their climate and what the climate can offer them based on what my geography is. 
Obviously, it's also based on my lifestyle. And right now, I find that I like to make all sorts of flower arrangements that are also scented. So herbal components are very, very important to me. I like to put things up for the winter. So I also want things that I can dice and chop up that I can freeze and I can have in the winter as well as during the growing season. And I also like an area that is beautiful, that is a I think um, a very impactful, entertaining venue. So I like to entertain out in my garden. I like to have brunches and container garden parties and cocktail parties. All of that is part of what I consider to be my garden lifestyle. And all of these things are based on my own interests and what my priorities are. And my priorities right now consist of having a really, really beautiful garden in the spring and in the fall. I don't prioritize summer quite so much because it's just too hot and I like to travel. So all of those kinds of things and those kinds of interests will inform whether or not you have good garden fit in your landscape. And then very, very obviously, the the architecture of your home, the lines, the leading lines of your home, whether they are straight and linear or curved and rounded, that might inform the design of your garden beds and make sure that there is consonance and that there is harmony between your garden and your home. So in terms of of good garden fit, this uh, diagram pretty much says it all. I kind of know what I want. I know what my dream garden is with good garden fit. And then I know the context within which I garden and the constraints and the limitations that are informed by this garden context. And then where all of those things come together, that tells me what is possible to create my dream garden that has good garden fit. And if I disregard any one of those factors, then I'm going to create sometimes frustration, um, sometimes maybe even unhappy neighbors, if I don't take into account all of those different elements. Now, really important to me in creating my own garden landscape is the use of what I think of as signature touches. And signature touches are those things that make your garden very uniquely and specially yours. And that will change based on your style of gardening. So for me, the objectives that I have as it relates to my own garden touches are that I want it to be a romantic garden. I don't want it to be sweet. I want it to have pretty good year-round good looks and structure versus, oh, just constant flowering abundance that later in the heat of the summer can look kind of messy. And I want all of it to be rhythmic and in harmony versus lots of contrast and visual chord. So because discord. So because of that, I keep it to a limited color palette. I don't have lots of different colors that can compete with one another, both in my vegetables, in my edibles, and also in my ornamentals. I like it to look tailored and crisp most of the time. So I have a manicured gas uh, grass edge. I really like lots of clipped evergreens, which look good and provide foundational architecture year round, even in the dead of winter. Um, I like the organic Uh, look and feel of gravel as flooring. I like the noises that it makes when you walk across it. I love the fact that it contributes to good drainage. And then again, as I said earlier, for me, it gets so, so unbearably hot in the summer where I live that I like to really use most of my seasonal color in the spring and in the fall versus in the summer when it is so much more labor intensive and difficult to keep looking good. Now, as you're thinking through this, to help you get 
clarity. It's sometimes, and this is sometimes something that you want to put together as you become more and more experienced as a gardener. You add this, you add to it over time, you delete some things, you learn things, you read something, and it really resonates with you. And once you do that, I think it's so fun to put together your own garden manifesto. And I have done that. And a manifesto is things that just I know to be true about my garden and things that I, I know about myself that makes the things on my list really speak volumes. So for example, one of them is don't let your plants boss you. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you planted way too much mint and now it is taking over your garden, then And you be the boss of that mint and you bring it under control. If a plant doesn't want to grow well in one area and you really want to plant it in your landscape, then do a three strikes and you're out. Don't let it just sit there and sulk in one location where it's not happy. You have the power. You can move it to a different locations. A different location. Now in, in my neck of the woods, in your neck of the woods, it might be different, but here in my southern garden, I know that there's really only two seasons. There's before the heat and there's after the heat. If you're farther north, there may be only two seasons. There is before the cold and after the cold. But just keeping that in mind constantly as I plant things helps me be a better gardener. I also think that a garden is about a lifestyle and it's a whole living environment. It's not just about the gardener. It's about the other residents of the garden as well. The insects, the bird life, the wind, the people that come and visit your garden. And so a garden to me is just that. It's a way to live your life. It's not just a stage set where you take lots of pretty pictures. Um, you should make your garden live up to your lifestyle, not the other way around. And then I have found most importantly over years of gardening, particularly as I age along with my garden, that a little bit every day beats a torn disc and backbreaking labor later. And it also means knowing when to ask for help. I used to think that it didn't count if I didn't do it myself. Well, now I have realized who's counting. And if it can save me from a bodily injury, then I will definitely know when to ask for help. As you're designing your garden, as you're creating your own garden style, I think in addition to the plants that you grow, the vegetables that you cultivate, a lot of the style of your garden and the look of your garden is also going to be realized by the stuff of your gardens. And by that, I mean your garden ornaments, your container plantings, the type of containers that you use, the style of your garden, whether it's um, it's rectilinear and contemporary looking, like these raised beds on the lower right, or if it's very cottagey and cutesy looking almost, like this charming cottage on the left. So your garden ornaments will also help you reflect your garden personality and your own um, your own sense of style by just what you use to adorn it. And I really think that in terms of your garden style and garden elements, nothing reflects your garden style quite as much as the containers that you use. You'll get a completely different feel if you are using aged terracotta versus glossy and metal or or glazed and or, or maybe even plastic. It really helps create continuity and harmony if your garden, if in your garden, if all of your comp- your containers relate to one another, if they relate to one another in style, in size, and in substance. So you might want to consider restraining yourself um, in terms of the different variety of materials that you use, because it can end up looking kind of cluttered and not well thought out. 
if you use too much variety versus a little bit more straight goes, restraint goes a long way. I'd also say that particularly if you garden in an area like mine where temperatures get extremely hot or extremely cold, that the larger the container, the better, because it will help your plants, your container plants, if they um, overwinter, it will help them really to make it through and survive a very cold winter or a very hot summer. Now, when you're being very specific about edibles for container gardens, you can, I, I would just tell you to experience, to experiment. There's no right way or wrong way. There's just the way that you do it and you have fun doing it. So I encourage you to really just you know, go out on a limb and try all sorts of things. I have successfully grown small pumpkins in containers. I've grown eggplants. I have grown huge trees of rosemary and bay. But you can also grow things like potatoes and peppers. Almost anything is fodder for container culture. But you you can really have fun with it, I think, if you decide to use some of, this is what I'm into right now, some of the miniature vegetables, because there's nothing quite like dollhouse gardening to make it fun and to make your little ones have fun with you in the garden. Dollhouse gardening, if you will. So you might want to try some little pomegranate crunch mini lettuces, thumbelina carrots, um, mini pumpkins, mini cucumbers, squashes. Really have fun, not only in the, in the growth and the cultivation of it, but also on on the hunt. So get your kids involved, look online, look in your no local nurseries and garden centers and see what you can find in the way of miniature vegetables and fruits. Well, you've probably figured out by now that I am not going to be your go-to source for exactly what vegetables are the best varieties to plant or exactly what you need to do to improve your soil. There are far more experienced, credible people who will probably be presenting here in this media, in this garden festival, who know a lot more about those topics than I. What I'm trying to convey is just different tips and techniques that you can use to create, design, and really develop a beautiful gardening lifestyle based on edibles and ornamentals in your landscape. So now let's look at a bunch of pretty pictures and a few tips that we can fairly quickly run through that might give you some ideas for your own edible landscape. So if you feel a little bit at this point, like I've discussed mostly what you can't do, let's have some fun and let me give you some tips on what you can do. And these things are givens whether or not you are kind of Oh, maybe modifying an existing garden or landscape, or you're starting afresh, or you're just about to go out the door and buy some containers to plant some vegetables in. It really doesn't make any difference because these, uh, the, the point remains that you're just going to look for things that inspire you. And a good place to start is by perusing different beautiful gardening books, going on garden tours, um, Pinterest, go online, visit your neighbors. Um, there's just, there are just catalogs. There's just an endless variety of sources where you can find inspiration to help you develop your own garden design and help you try to realize what type of organization and scale is perfect for you, taking into account access to those spaces so that you can work comfortably that will really benefit fit you and meet your lifestyle needs in both the short term and the long term and then what color and compositions really speak to you so that you can personalize and, and express yourself so this is a picture of my overall back landscape the Vodder garden that studio is where I film a lot of things and you can see if you're looking at this image just to the right is where the potager is located and the potager is 
faces, well, let me put it this way. The side of the, the studio that faces the potage faces north. So mine is on a north-south exposure. It gets pretty good light for most of the day. It is a destination garden that is far away from my house, so or not too far, but you definitely have to navigate the backyard to get to it. And so it's got a sense of, of intimacy and a sense of destination that it wouldn't have if I decided to locate it a little bit closer to the house. So this visual gives you an idea of how it interacts and relates to everything else in my garden. And as I said, this was an enclosed space. So for me, it's enclosed by a fence, by a brick wall, by some features that I built, by a short fence and a tall fence on the other side. But for you, those, those enclosures might consist of different types of things, maybe an evergreen hedge, um, and maybe a different type of fencing. But enclosure does a number of things for you in terms of how you communicate your style, how you can regulate airflow and air circulation. And also it might be an important factor in blocking wind and other things that make this area more exposed to the elements. And here is just kind of a brief recitation of enclosure and what they can do in terms of intimacy, privacy, um, how they can help you in my case, kind of help me organize my thinking in terms of design and labor. So when I'm working in my garden, a lot of times I'll think, oh, well, I'll work in the potage today. Tomorrow I will, I will work in a different area. And it also then I can break that down even further and say, oh, well, today I'm going to work in this one quadrant of my potage within the bo boxwood hedge. So it really keeps me honest and it makes it make it, the design itself makes it seem more manageable to me and how I can break it down into different parts. Here is a completely different style of a vegetable garden that very much relates to the homeowner's ideals and ideas for her own garden space. She wanted things that were a little bit more at counter height. So some of her beds were custom built to be raised beds. It's enclosed to keep out her dogs, um, but yet she took into account things like making sure that the gate was wide enough so that her wheelbarrow could get through. It's a completely different style, but you could definitely be inspired by how this might fit into a different setting than my own. Entry is just, it's just something, well, let me put it this way. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And a beautiful entry does just that. It helps make a beautiful first impression that hopefully is consistent with the style of your garden. It can be really grand or very simple. In this case, this is how the entry to my potage used to look. And I had it up because I wanted to, the arbor was in place because I wanted to grow roses over it, but also because at that time I had a small little dog and I needed a gate to kind of enclose it and keep my dog inside the yard area. So it was informed not only by aesthetics, but also practicalities. But it doesn't have to be an arbor or a formal entry. It can be something as simple as a short fence or gates or pillars. Um, but what I love about a really wonderful entry is I think it is experiential. And what do I mean by that? Well, that means that it is sensory. So you might smell some fragrant roses or you might smell some chives or something as you pass through the entry. The light may change. Um, you might have a water feature in the distance, but all of those things can definitely make it seem more experiential and participatory in general. Here is an example, probably the quintessential example of what I consider to be a gardening lifestyle. And that is that the potager, while not seen here, is positioned in the back. And I can 
I can pick and harvest from my potage, bring that stuff into the kitchen, and then I can make up, whip up something, whether it's bruschetta or it's some kind of pesto or it's a full meal, I can then serve my guests literally from garden to table outside on my dining deck. Now, for me, I wanted something that would work with the aesthetics of my home, the practicalities related to the best growing environment for my vegetables and for um, my edibles, but that also would fit into my style of gardening. So when I took into account how it was organized, the scale of it and how accessible it was, I took into account how I wanted it to look. So I wanted to have an English look. Consequently, it's organized by dividing up my garden beds into partitions with boxwood edging. I wanted it to fit the space that I had designated. So that basically was a sense of scale that was superimposed upon me even before I started the design. And then I wanted it to be be accessible, but not too accessible. I wanted to make it feel like I was going somewhere in, um, in the mornings or in the evenings to harvest without it being right outside my back door. And what this does is it, it, it kind of relates to what I call my theory of garden relativity. And that is that every one thing in the garden relates to every other thing. So the location of my potage relates to where my outdoor studio is located, where it is in reference to my kitchen, where it is and how it is designed in terms of the arbors, the fences, the things that grow vertically and the things that grow horizontally, because I know that every one thing relates to every other thing. So this is how I plan a garden and I design a garden. You can pick one point of departure and then relate everything else to it. I also wanted to make sure that my own design was flexible and adaptable. And by that, I mean it could contract or expand over time. So I grew uh, a larger area of space dedicated to edibles when my sons were both home and their appetites were large and I had to keep up with them. Um, but something that also could contract when I got to the point where I didn't want to grow so many things and it would still be beautiful and fit my own culinary needs. I wanted it to be basically adaptable, adapt to not only my needs for edibles and my own kitchen, but also adaptable to my knees and my back and my aging body as my body ages along with the garden. So all of these different things will you need to take into account to make sure that your garden is both flexible and adaptable. And of course, most importantly, is flexible and adaptable taking into consideration what is required to make your plants happy in terms of light, access to water. You're probably not going to want to locate your your dedicated vegetable garden or an area that needs to be watered frequently that is far away from a water source, whether that's a water barrel, whether that is a hose, whether you have access to a well, you do want to take that into account and have it nearby so you're not lugging yards upon yards of heavy rubber hose to get moisture to your precious garden beds. For me, uh, gardening in, in clay soil, drainage is essential. I have positioned a site so that it's a little bit protected from the high Oklahoma winds and also that it gets enough airflow so I don't have a, a real big problem with powdery mildew and infestations like spider mite and things. Good air circulation will help prevent a variety of problems.
Now, here's a great example. This is from my friend Klaus Dalby, who who has a fabulous container vegetable garden. And he gardens in Scandinavia. And if you can only garden in containers, I mean, it It can just be as dramatic and as beautiful as you want. And this is a perfect example of this. Again, I want my garden to not only be flexible, but to adapt with me. So as I get older... I take these things into account. I make sure that I warm up and I stretch that when I get new tools for my garden, that they help, uh, that they're labor saving, that they're not too heavy, that they make chores like watering a lot easier. And it may be that for you, if you're going to all of a sudden start gardening with your grandchildren or with your children, then you might want to take that into account and make sure that some of those those tools and garden ornaments and garden fixtures are scaled to little ones because you want them to encourage um, garden participation as well. And then you can express yourself, probably this is the most obvious thing, with color and composition of your plantings. You want to plant things for their color, but also vibrant enough that they will attract pollinators. You might want to take into account both your edibles and your ornamentals if you're going to be doing a lot of of cutting for the vase. So whenever I plant really edibles or herbs, um, certain vegetables, I take into account what will look beautiful in my vase as well as a beautiful composition in terms of texture and color in the garden. And then I really like to exploit color echoes both in my container gardens and in my garden beds. And that is really an emphasis on tone on tone and where some of the minor features in a plant like the veining in a leaf of a Swiss chard or the interior of a lily or the different hues in a berry, those kinds of things can then be replicated in different colors and foliage in the area to create some really beautiful color echoes. And you guys are probably mostly familiar with this, with the color chart and your tastes and and preferences might be more monochromatic, complementary, or analogous. I tend to like things that are more monogram, monochromatic and gradations of a hue rather than lots of different discordant colors. And then, you know, you want to be continually motivated to garden And gardening never gets old to me. And I I think it makes me feel a sense of garden responsibility. Um, I know it's contributing to my lifestyle and wellness. (coughs) Excuse me. I can pretty easily get in my resistance training by lifting a pot or my 10,000 steps a day by going back and forth to my compost pile just by working out in the garden. And then the real motivator is it just gives me so much joy. I love celebrating the seasons in my community, and I don't really think there is any better way to do that than by growing a garden. In this instance here, you can see lots of my topiaries that are signature touches. And in the background, you can see that I've got lots of lavender and rosemary topiaries that not only look beautiful when they're outside in the winter or in the summer and in the spring and in the fall, but are equally as beautiful when I bring them in and I use them around the holidays to decorate my table, my my um, interior vignettes, and my home in general. And then we're not only doing what is good for us, but we're doing, or we hope we are doing what is good for the planet by being water wise, trying to garden as organically as we can, 
composting, um, planting a lot of variety of flowers, herbs, and edibles, not just for us and for our table and for our gardens, but also for the the in, insect wildlife habitat and wildlife habitat in general. That is what really brings our gardens to life and helps us share the wealth. So I, I hope that you can kind of see that these things, excuse me there, these things will help you develop just a, a, a real sense of ownership in your little spot of earth that you toil, whether it's in the ground, in raised beds, whether you are organically gardening in a large area or in a small area, you can play your part by maybe not being so fastidious about how your garden looks. That's a difficult one for me. But by using organic solutions like organic fungicides and, and insecticides and just trying to prevent problems from ever starting by taking into account drainage and air circulation, being able to identify what the good bugs are from the bad bugs and really doing your research. This is where the internet and technology can be your friend. Use apps that will help you identify little predators and garden pests and will also help give you some solutions and some remedies for whatever the issues are. Because we really want to make sure that our garden is not just for us, but is for the, the winged wildlife as well. Again, be careful about it's what all is in your garden, including yourself. <laughs> So make sure that you stretch and you prevent injuries. You're not just trying to prevent problems like powdery mildew and black spot. You're also trying to prevent health injuries and health issues. On more than one occasion, I have called 911 for neighbors who got dehydrated or who hurt themselves when pruning their trees. So please be wise and be careful, all in an effort to really create a beautiful garden, not just for yourself, not just for your family, but for your community and for just gardening as a celebration in its entirety. So I just hope you guys will get out there Grow an edible landscape of your own, however you define it, and on whatever scale or size, but just start. Just start somewhere. If you're a new gardener, that is probably the best advice I can give you is start, observe, research, and then execute, because I promise you it is life enhancing and you will never regret it. You can follow me on my Instagram account at Potage Blog. I do lots of, of in tutorials on design and landscaping and a gardening lifestyle on my YouTube channel on Linda Vodder, uh, at Linda Vodder. And then you can also reach me at my email address or sign up to receive more current information at info at lindavodder.com. And my book is available in April on Amazon. So thanks, you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Now go out and garden. <laughs>